So I hope you all had a good weekend, and I hope you're ready to have a, a good Veterans Day holiday. Um, so today is the last lecture before your second midterm, and there's a lot of stuff to get through. Um, I probably won't get that far into tides, but uh, do bear in mind that tides will be covered on the exam. I may carry over one or two of the questions until the final if I don't get to them today, however. But they're still, they're, you're still responsible for the relevant parts of the book, and that pretty much is everything I'm going to talk about here anyway. So at the end of the day on Friday, we started talking about waves breaking. And I showed you this video, which I'm showing again. Um, here we have a water wave. Uh, in this case, it's, of course, in the lab. So it's being generated probably by a piston rather than by wind or some other cause. And as it gets into shallower and shallower water, it becomes steeper and steeper, and eventually it breaks. And you can see that it's actually losing energy as it breaks. It's making bubbles. It's presumably making lots of splashing noises. As the wave gets into shallow water, it becomes, the energy becomes more and more concentrated into a smaller volume of water. And eventually, the wave just can't sustain that amount of energy in the volume of water it's passing through. And it breaks and starts to lose that energy as it gets into shallower water. And this is going to repeat itself over and over again. Regardless of the source of the energy of the wave, they tend to lose that wave energy when they come into water that's too shallow. And we can actually write some sort of rules of thumb for when that process is going to take place. The basic idea being that surface water waves in the ocean, or in fresh water for that matter, uh, can really only remain stable as long as they have an angle around the crust of about 120 degrees or more. Okay, so you can think of sort of a fat triangle where this is the crest of the wave, this is the back side, this is the front side. If this angle gets to be less than about 120 degrees, if it gets too sharp, the wave tends to fall apart, tends to lose its energy. And for shallow water waves, which is what we're talking about here, this is going to tend to occur when the ratio of the wave height, which remember is the distance from the crest to the trough in vertical, in the vertical direction, relative to the wave length between crests or between troughs, you could define it either way, is about 1 to 7. And it also roughly occurs when the height of the wave is getting close to the total depth of the water, something like 3 quarters of the depth of the water. Okay, so. You can think of this as going one, two, three, four. So this wave is getting to be just about to the point where it's going to start to crash, or it's going to start to break. And so you can imagine if we have a wave coming towards shore, and let's just think of a typical wind wave with a wavelength of maybe 100 meters or so, like you might see out at Santa Monica Pier. Out in the deep ocean, the water depth is much, much greater than the wavelength, so the wave acts like a deep water wave. The little particles of water are moving around in circular orbits, and those orbits are getting smaller and smaller the deeper you go, and they basically go to zero well before you reach the bottom. So the wave travels as if it doesn't realize that the bottom is there. Its speed is dependent only on its wavelength. But eventually, as it approaches shore, it's going to cross some boundary in which the sh the bottom of the ocean gets close enough to the surface that it's interfering with the, motion, the circular motions of the water particles as the wave goes by. And so the wave starts to feel that the ocean bottom is there. And it gets shallower and shallower until eventually the water depth is of order 1 20th of the wavelength, in which case it becomes a true shallow water wave. And at that point, the speed of the wave becomes dependent basically entirely on the water depth rather than the wavelength, going as the square root of the water depth. So as that wave gets into shallower and shallower water, it's slowing down. And so the same number of waves will be packed into a smaller and smaller area of the ocean. The wave length is getting shorter as it gets into shallower water. And because you're packing more and more energy into less space laterally and into less space vertically, because the water is getting shallower, the wave is going to get steeper because the energy is getting bound up into a smaller and smaller area. So it's pulling up a bigger wave. And eventually, that wave passes the magic angle of 120 degrees or so, and it just starts to collapse. And the details of how the wave collapses, how it breaks, actually depend in some sense on how quickly the water is getting shallow. In this case, the picture is like a nice surfing wave with a big curl. That's most commonly what happens when water depth gets shallow relatively quickly. If the water depth is very gradually getting shallow, simply the peak of the wave will start to collapse down into the front of it, and you'll get a spilling breaker 
the wave will gradually break from top to bottom. And then, of course, eventually it reaches the shore and simply pulls up onto the shore and loses much or most of its energy, depending, again, on the details of how steep the shoreline is. So the basic idea is we have a transition from a deep water wave where the speed depends on the wavelength to a shallow water wave where the speed depends on the water depth. And as the water depth gets very small, that wave gets compacted into too small of a volume of water and begins to break. It can't hold onto that energy anymore and it starts to lose it. Okay, so the basic idea is that waves break as a consequence of interacting with the ocean bottom. Okay. And typically the way this works is that the crest of the wave, the part of the wave that's locally over the deepest water, tends to overshoot the, tr the trough in front of it and so it tends to fall over into the trough in front of it, either gradually or abruptly, depending on how quickly the seafloor is getting shallow. Okay. So you can think of this process of shoaling, slowing down of waves, as being analogous to what would happen if you were running along okay, on a nice, even surface. And all of a sudden, you got to do a very rough surface, and you kept, a tr you kept on trying to run just as fast. Okay? If you were trying to run through mud off of uh, asphalt, your feet wouldn't be able to keep up with the rest of your body because they're trying to plow through this mud, and you would just fall right over onto your face. That's basically what happens to these waves. They're getting into a region where the shoreline is uh, Rising seafloor is slowing them down, and the upper parts of the wave don't quite realize it yet, and they keep going forward too fast and overshoot their feet. And we can see a computer model of this kind of process happening. This is a model made for a very small wave, so just like a ripple, really, which makes it a little easier to see. And what we're seeing here is this wave gradually steepening into shallower water. And eventually what happens when it reaches this magic angle of about 120 degrees is the top of the wave just becomes unstable and falls over into the trough in front of it. Okay, and so we get a much more turbulent process. The colors here are indicating either speed or vorticity, the sort of rotation, the turbulence in the water. And so as that wave gets too steep, it sort of collapses on itself. And that process of going from a nice, coherent, simple wave to a much more complicated wave with smaller scale tends to lose energy. So this is a wave that's losing its energy as it gets too steep. Okay, and then this is an example for a small ripple. If you had a really big wave, of course, there would be more energy involved in the breaking enough that you would actually fragment the water surface. You would make foam, you would make bubbles, and so on. All right, so are there any questions about the basic idea of breaking a wave? Yes? Yeah, so the question is about the angle of 120. So the basic idea is that sort of the maximum amount of energy that a wave can carry efficiently is enough to displace the surface so that the peak makes an angle of something like 120 degrees or more, okay? So it's flatter than 120 degrees. When it gets steeper than that, it tends to fall apart. Any other questions? Yes? Um, so that's mo mainly, this is actually a cheat. So this is actually a wave in the wake of a boat. So it's not quite fair because it's not breaking for a normal reason. Um, but an, under normal circumstances, the, whether or not you get a spilling breaker that breaks gradually without making a curl or a plunging breaker that makes a nice curl uh, depends on how, how quickly that transition occurs to break the wave. If it's very gradual, if you have a seafloor that rises very gradually to the surface, the wave breaks more or less gradually from the top down into the trough. And so you just get a spilling breaker. There's never a curl. If it breaks abruptly, if the seafloor is going along pretty deep and then it jumps up, the wave will all of a sudden pass that threshold. And the top of the wave and much of the middle part of the wave will actually collapse all at the same time, overshooting the rest of the wave. So it's a matter of abruptness. Any other questions? So if you go out to Santa Monica on a typical day, that's a fairly gradual shoreline. And so often you'll get spilling breakers coming in. That's really common in places like the Atlantic coast, where the, you have the sand that just gradually gets deeper and deeper offshore. You find really good surfing waves, typically in places where there's like a breakwater or an offshore rocky shelf or a reef or something like that, where the water depth changes fairly quickly because there's a hard surface with a vertical relief. <laughs> 
OK. So we're going to talk about a special kind of wave, tsunami. We've talked about wind waves already. But tsunami are particularly interesting from the perspective of an oceanography class that has a component of earth science in it. And tsunami is a Japanese word. Um, I think those are the kanji for it I've put in there. I hope I did it right. Um, and it basically means literally harbor wave or port wave. And the English analog, although we don't use it very often anymore, but many of you have probably heard it, tidal wave, right? And they're both interesting descriptions for what a tsunami is because that's, in the case of a tidal wave, it's not caused by tides. OK, let's get that right out of the way. But they're both interesting because in the case of harbor wave, it may be that the origin of this word has to do with it being a kind of wave that you really don't detect when you're in the open ocean. You only detect this kind of wave on a normal scale, human scale, when it gets close to shoreline. So the idea would be that a fisherman would set out in the morning to go fishing, and you would have a day fishing, and then you would come back, and all of a sudden the port would be flooded, and there would be all kinds of damage, and he has no idea what happened when he was out to sea because he didn't notice the wave go by. It just did damage when it reached shore. And the English word tidal wave may have kind of a similar origin in some sense in that it's a wave that behaves like a tide. It's a wave with such a long wavelength that you don't notice it out to sea. But when it reaches shore and breaks, its wavelength, its period is so long that it essentially floods in for perhaps minutes at a time. That's how long it takes the crest to reach shore. And so it feels like a tide. It feels like a flood rather than a nor normal wave that might break for a few seconds and then wash right back out again. But it's important to remember that tsunamis are not features of harbors, and they aren't caused by tides. They are instead waves that derive their energy from some kind of tectonic event, which can be an earthquake. It can be a landslide. It can be volcanic eruption. Could, in principle, be something like a meteorite impact. And if we plot the sources of large tsunamis over the past, this is actually supposed to be synoptic. So it goes back, sorry, not synoptic. That was the wrong word. I'm listening to too many meteorology talks lately. Um, it's going back to the 1600s, in which case some of these tsunamis, or actually it's going back to 1600 BC. So some of these are inferred from historical records. Some of them are actual modern records from seismometers and modern tidal gauges. So there's a whole mishmash of things together. And hopefully you can see that tsunami sources are not evenly distributed across the planet's surface. They are located, sourced primarily in a few places. And hopefully these places are already familiar to you because they're more or less corresponding to, well, what? OK, they correspond to the Ring of Fire. But more generally, they aren't all in the Pacific. Yeah, they correspond to plate boundaries. And what kinds of plate boundaries? <coughs> Mostly convergent plate boundaries. That's right. So the ring of fire is a ring of convergent plate boundaries, but that's not all the plate boundaries that are convergent. There are some in the Mediterranean, for instance. There are some in the Caribbean. There's actually a convergent plate boundary right here near the Lesser Antilles. And pretty much wherever you have a convergent boundary, you are likely to have sources of damaging tsunamis, potentially, both because these are areas are where earthquakes occur, of course. Plate boundaries of all kinds tend to have earthquakes. But you notice they're not as common near divergent boundaries and transform boundaries. It also turns out that they are located near volcanoes. And of course, the biggest volcanoes on land tend to be associated with convergent boundaries as well. So tsunamis are particularly likely to occur near convergent boundaries, though not always. For instance, Hawaii can cause tsunamis. It's a big volcano there. It certainly has earthquakes, and you can have landslides. And there are also volcanic islands in the Atlantic and other oceans that can have caused tsunamis for much the same reason. OK, so let's look at a typical sequence that might cause a tsunami along a convergent boundary, in particular, earthquake-generated convergent boundary tsunami. OK, so. Let's go back. We're going to focus in, at least for a model, on the really devastating Banda Aceh earthquake, which occurred, well, it started off the north coast of Sumatra and in Indonesia and propagated west through much of the Indian Ocean, actually causing damage in places like 
uh, Kenya on the African coast, and also propagated eastward to places like Thailand and caused lots of damage in the beach resorts there. Okay, so the basic idea is we have a plate boundary. To the southwest, we have the Indian and Australian plate. And under Sumatra, we have the Eurasian plate, although it's sometimes differentiated out into a smaller Sunda plate, but we can, for the purposes of this class, connect it to the big Eurasian plate. And we have a convergent boundary. Okay? And in this case, we have more or less continental crust on the right side. We have oceanic crust on the left side. And so the left side is going to be going down. And we have a long plate boundary that can have very large earthquakes. And in the case of the Banda Aceh earthquake, it was a magnitude 9.0. It was one of the biggest earthquakes ever recorded. Broke hundreds of kilometers of this plate boundary all at once and moved it 10 or 20 meters. Okay, so it was a really huge earthquake over a very large region of the seafloor, and it was all underwater. And so we can imagine, okay, we store up seismic energy and then release it in the earthquake. And the Eurasian plate essentially bounces back, okay, when that earthquake energy is released. And imagine this happening over thousands of kilometers of the ocean. And you can think of it as being like a very large pebble hitting the ocean from the bottom, okay, and ripples heading out from there. Now, in the case of the Banda Aceh earthquake, it was so long, okay, that it didn't really make a circular wave. It made kind of an oblong wave because the source was this long linear feature on the seafloor. And so if we look at a slightly more detailed model of that particular earthquake, and this is not the most recent one, but gives you an idea. Here's Sumatra. Here's Southeast Asia. Here's India and Sri Lanka. The coast of Africa would be over here somewhere. So we're looking in the northern part of the Indian Ocean. And the earthquake started near here and actually ran up and down this boundary by quite a, quite a distance. And so in this case, this is a computer model of what a wave might look like for a model seismic source. And this is a little bit outdated, I believe. So if you were to look for a more recent model, the source might be a little different. But this gives you an idea of how the wave might propagate. And those of you who are sitting near the front, you might actually be able to see there's actually a little timer. Let's see. There's a timer right down here in minutes. This is essentially, oops, starting from when the earthquake happened. And you can see that the waves are actually spreading out in two directions. And a couple of things are happening here. Hopefully you can see that it's kind of like that ripple pattern, perhaps a bit more complex going to the east, to the west. But all kinds of crazy stuff is happening here on the east. And what you can see here is, in fact, a wave breaking. So the energy is getting concentrated into the water that's too shallow for it. And it's getting magnified. And you can also see, by the way, if I stop it, see if I can actually stop it this time. I'll try to stop it just when it hits Sri Lanka, but I'm not sure if this will work. OK. So I stopped this model when the first waves are just about to reach Sri Lanka, which there was a lot of damage there. And Sri Lanka is all the way across the Bay of Bengal. Okay? It's, this is a wave that's traveled like 1,000 kilometers or more. Okay? So we're not very close to the earthquake. People in Sri Lanka didn't feel the earthquake particularly. And if you look at the timer here, this is at about 100 minutes. So this is how far the wave propagated in a little more than an hour and a half. It went all the way across an ocean basin, basically. And it was only a few hours later when it was hitting the coast of Africa. So this wave was traveling close to 1,000 kilometers per hour. It was traveling faster than you would travel if you were on a jet plane. This is just the same thing looking down from above. It's not quite an identical model. It has perhaps a bit more realistic source. So we have a large area of the fault all breaking at once. And you can see again that the wave is hitting Sri Lanka within about an hour and a half, okay, and is starting to approach the African coast within two or three hours. So this is a really interesting case. It was, of course, a terrible disaster in many respects. And is one good thing that hopefully will come out of this is the development of a good tsunami warning network in the Indian Ocean, which wasn't present before. Um, 
But it was also, from a scientific perspective, a little bit of an accidental bonanza because it turned out by happenstance that we had a couple of satellites that flew over this tsunami while it was traversing the Bay of Bengal, while it was going across the northern Indian Ocean in the open ocean. Okay? And we've already talked about these satellites, in fact. They were Topex Poseidon and Jason 1. We talked about these satellites in the context of understanding the shape of the seafloor. These are satellites that we can determine their position in the sky very accurately, and they can measure their distance above the ocean surface very accurately. So you can measure disturbances in the ocean surface, which we can infer back to say something about gravity anomalies under the seafloor and infer something about the shape of the seafloor. Or in this case, we can actually graph out the passage of a wave. Okay? And it was just happenstance. These don't go over the entire planet all the time. You know, they orbit every hour or so. It just happened that they were going over the northern Indian Ocean right after this earthquake happened. And so we have records. Here's a computer model of, similar to the ones I showed you, of the tsunami propagating. Here is Sumatra. Here is Sri Lanka. Here's the southern part of India. Here's the Horn of Africa over here. And this is the track that the satellites were taking. So they happened to go right across the northern part of the Indian Ocean, right across that tsunami wave as it was propagating. Okay? It wasn't near any of the coastlines yet. It was just traversing the deep ocean. And there, here's the record of the sea surface. And there's a pass where it had gone over before the earthquake happened, before the tsunami was generated. And here's the pass that went over the tsunami, and there's actually some missing data, so this just connects, but presumably the wave also went through here somewhat. So, based on this record, how big was this wave when it was in the middle of the Indian Ocean? How, what was its wave height? That axis is in centimeters. Here's the crust. It's at about 60 centimeters. Here's the trough, roughly. It's at about minus 50. So what's the height of that wave? A little louder. I think I heard it. It's about 100 centimeters, right? 60 minus minus 50. OK, so about 110 centimeters or something like that. So how big is that? That's about a meter. That much. That's how big this incredibly devastating tsunami was. Okay? You go out to Santa Monica Pier on an average, not very windy day, and that's how big the surf waves are going to be. Okay? So in the open ocean, this tsunami was really nothing special. It was a meter high. It came up to you know, a little above your knees, maybe. Okay? When a tsunami is in the open ocean, even if it's carrying a tremendous amount of energy, it's carrying a lot of that energy in very long wavelength waves. Okay? So it's spread out over a tremendous area of the ocean. The height of the wave, as it's carrying that energy, might not be very remarkable. In fact, they're usually quite small. This was a really huge tsunami energy-wise, and yet it was only displacing the ocean surface in the open ocean by about a meter. If you were sailing a boat, you would never notice this wave had gone by because there are all these chops and swells going by that are the same size that are going by much more quickly. It's only when a tsunami comes into shallow water and breaks, in fact, that it tends to cause damage. Okay? The Poseidon Adventure notwithstanding, at least the original version of the Poseidon Adventure from the 70s, that was kind of what caused the boat to turn over. I haven't actually seen the more recent one. Is it the same cause? I can't remember. So way out here in the open Indian Ocean, this wave was only about a meter high. It was nothing special. But that wavelength was so long, okay, it was still carrying a lot of energy. It was just spread out over a tremendous area of the ocean. The critical thing is when that wave reaches shallow water, it slows down. So that same amount of energy is getting packed into less and less water. Okay? The wave crests are getting closer together spatially. And the wave energy is being carried in a shallower and shallower column of water. So as this wave reaches a coastline, as the water gets shallower, the wave builds up. Okay? All the energy is being packed into much, much smaller area volume of water. Okay? And it's the breaking of the wave that actually releases its destructive power, even though it's very small when it's out in the ocean. <laughs> 
Okay? And so here's the basic difference between a wind wave and a tsunami. In the open ocean, they may have very similar wave heights. A meter or so is perfectly typical for a wind wave. Okay? But a wind wave in the open ocean is maybe 100 meters in wavelength. It only extends to 50 meters depth. So it's only when it gets into very shallow water that its, in, what, that its energy starts to get concentrated. It doesn't build up very much. Okay, it builds up enough to break, builds up enough to surf, builds up enough to do some erosion, but it's not going to wash away an entire town. Tsunamis, particularly, particularly large ones, like the ones that were generated by this very large earthquake, may have wavelengths of hundreds of kilometers. Okay? So the same height is displaced over a much larger area of ocean, and it's behaving as a shallow water wave everywhere in the ocean. Okay? Its speed is basically always determined by the water depth. So whenever it reaches shallow water, shallower than the deepest water it's passing through, that energy is always getting concentrated in that shallow water. And so it gets concentrated and concentrated and concentrated and concentrated when it actually reaches shoreline. It's concentrated to an unprecedented degree or a very large degree by orders of magnitude and wave height, perhaps. Okay, so as the wave gets near shore, the wavelengths get shorter. The energy is carried in a smaller volume of water. The wave height may go up by a factor of 10 or more. And the energy is getting more and more concentrated. When that wave finally breaks, because of the very long period, the very long initial wavelength of the wave, it may break and the crest may actually be at the shoreline for minutes instead of for a second or two. Okay, so when the crest finally reaches shoreline, it can actually invade the shoreline for hundreds of meters, perhaps kilometers, over that minute or two minutes or five minutes in which the crest of the wave is passing into the shore. So here's a, this is actually kind of an artistic model, but it has some science behind it. And this was designed to, just, to maybe give a picture of how a tsunami wave would look if it reached a part of the shore in Alaska. So that's why everything's covered with snow here. But the same goes for a tsunami anywhere. In this case, the trough of the tsunami reaches the shoreline first. And it doesn't look like a wave. It looks like there's a really low tide. Okay? And then as the crest comes towards the shoreline, okay, it, again, it's a breaking wave, but it may not look like a breaking wave. It may just look like a flood because the period of this wave is so long. And of course, even cold water can melt snow. Okay, so let's see some pictures of the actual tsunami. This is a picture of Kalatara Beach, which is in Sri Lanka. So remember, we're talking hundreds of miles, a thousand kilometers or more away from the place where the earthquake actually happened to generate the tsunami wave. And this is what it looks like, looked like before the tsunami hit. Okay, we have a community. These are roads. So this is maybe the nearest block to the beach, and you can actually see the shoreline here. This picture is maybe depicting an area a couple kilometers across. And here is the trough of the tsunami reaching that shoreline. Okay, so in this case, it's a low part of the wave that's reaching shoreline first, so the water is actually being drawn out. Okay, and remember, this is a block. Okay, these are little houses. And all of a sudden, the waves that were breaking at the beach are now breaking perhaps a quarter mile offshore. Okay, so in this case, the wave was giving a warning. There was an unusually large drought of water. Okay. The trough hit before the crest did. But of course, the crest is coming eventually. And particularly, if you look at places that are a little bit closer to where the earthquake that caused the tsunami occurred, you can see that the crest actually did a tremendous amount of damage. And it behaved in many respects like a flood, okay, a flood coming from the ocean. So we're looking down at kind of a rural area not too far from where the earthquake started. Here's the shoreline. There's a beach down here in this corner of the picture. Here is a scale bar that's 100 meters. So again, this is a picture that's maybe a kilometer across. And you can see these are maybe little shrimp farm fields and an orchard. This is a road with a couple of bridges across this river. And this is right after the tsunami passed by. Okay, the shoreline has been completely modified. There is essentially no evidence that those aquaculture fields were ever there. The bridges have been washed out, even though they were something like a kilometer away from the shoreline. Okay? And the damage con continues well beyond the range of this image. 
Okay, so it's behaving like a flood, even though it's a wave, because the period of the wave is so long. And in fact, you can see this on an even broader scale. So this is a picture of northern Sumatra. Okay, by the way, Sumatra, if you look at it on a world map, it maybe doesn't look like such a big island, but its area is about 10% larger than the area of California. Okay, and it has about the same number of people as California. And here we're looking at a pretty fair chunk of the island, and Banda Aceh, which is where the earthquake was kind of centered, is up at the northwestern tip. This is before the earthquake. You can see basically greenery extending right out to the shoreline. If you look closely, you can maybe see some places where rivers are delivering sediment out into the local ocean. After the tsunami passes, Hopefully you can all see that there's a pretty marked brown line right along the shoreline, okay, indicating that the wave essentially wiped out the greenery and the first few hundred meters of the shoreline all the way along this island. All right, so just as a reminder, California is basically part of the Ring of Fire, even though our local plate boundary is not, strictly speaking, a convergent boundary. There are faults analogous to those kinds of faults in the California coast. And we're, of course, in the same ocean basin as many of these convergent boundaries. So a large tsunami generating earthquake in Alaska or Japan or the Philippines, for instance, could very easily send tsunami into our local waters. This is a model of a locally generated earthquake in the Channel Islands area. UCLA, by the way, is about 130 meters above sea level, so we don't have that much to worry about from a normal tsunami, anything that one would expect. But if you go to Venice Beach or southern parts of Santa Monica or the beach cities or Long Beach, those are all areas that are actually at significant risk from tsunamis. Okay? And particularly in the case of a locally generated tsunami, there probably wouldn't be very much warning because tsunamis travel so fast and we only have minutes. So we are actually at risk. Northern California, by the way, more so, but Southern California certainly. So this is a general education class. We should talk a little bit about you know, what can you do. We're not totally helpless in the face of these kinds of risks. Tsunami probably will occur. Los Angeles, broadly speaking, will be affected by tsunami at some point, even though it hasn't happened for quite a long time. And there are a couple ways to deal with this. One of them is dynamic defense. And this is one thing that was definitely lacking for the Banda Aceh earthquake. Okay? In particular, we know that most tsunamis are generated by things like volcanic eruptions, by landslides, by earthquakes, things that generate seismic signatures. So you, if you have a seismometer, you presumably know that the tsunami is likely to happen because you detect the earthquake that's generating the tsunami, and that earthquake wave travels much faster than the tsunami itself does. Okay? So good warning networks set up in such a way that the information can get out to the people who need to make use of it quickly are one way to deal with tsunami hazards, okay? reacting very quickly. Okay? And so part of that is seismic networks, and part of that is, for instance, putting buoys out in the ocean to actually detect that slow rise and fall as the tsunami passes in deep water, indicating that there might be damage when it reaches shallow water. And we have this kind of network, by the way, in the Pacific Ocean. Those of you who came to the extra credit movie after the first midterm, part of that buoy network that they were using to forecast surf conditions is actually there to prevent tsunami damage, okay, to give early warning of tsunamis that are coming towards Hawaii. That's not the only thing that can be done, however. Okay? It is also possible to, at least to some extent, defend statically against tsunami damage, to make sure that our infrastructure, our lives are lived in such a way that we aren't terribly vulnerable to these events, even if we don't see them coming. Okay? And this is really important because earthquakes in particular are not really predictable events. Okay? You, if an earthquake happens very far away, it may take the tsunami hours to reach you, but we can certainly have earthquakes happening right in our backyard and we don't know when the earthquake is going to happen. Okay? So essentially training everybody to use their own seismometer to realize that if there's a large earthquake, you don't want to be in low-lying areas. Okay? To recognize the warning signs, particularly if the tsunami gives you a break and the trough reaches shore before the crest does, there'll be an anomalous low tide. The water will draw out. Okay? And that's a definite warning sign that something's about to happen. That is not a good time to go out and explore the mudflats. Okay? 
And finally, really critically, maybe not so much for LA, but for other parts of the world, preserving natural buffers, okay? Wild areas or low-lying, not very intensely humanly inhabited areas of land that can absorb the tsunami energy before it reaches areas where it'll cause human impacts, okay? And we actually learned this lesson not in the context of tsunami, but in the context of hurricane protection from Katrina, we realized that, perhaps a bit too late, that the loss of wetlands in the low-lying parts of the Mississippi Delta had made towns like New Orleans more vulnerable to storm surges, which in many respects behave like tsunamis, although they take place over a longer period of time. All right, so are there any questions about tsunami? Yes? How far inland does tsunami go? The question is, how far inland does the tsunami go? And it, well, yeah, I'm not an expert on this, but it, it really depends on the type of shoreline. So in that picture I showed you, and this is, I think, reasonably common for estuary type environments, where you have a river coming into the ocean, you may have very low-lying areas extending many kilometers upstream. And furthermore, if the channel of the river is kind of tapering, the wave energy is not just getting concentrated in shallower water and a slower wave, but it's also getting channeled horizontally up that bore. And so you can have particularly devastating damage running up rivers. And it can certainly be many kilometers upstream. Yes? So I gave you an example at Kalatara Beach in Sri Lanka where the trough reached shore first. That's not, as far as I can tell, always the case. Sometimes the crest actually reaches the shoreline first. It's, it depends on what type of event caused the tsunami, and it depends on which side of the tsunami you're on. So it, there may be a trough before the crest, but there doesn't necessarily have to be. The crest can actually arrive first, I think. Uh -huh. You can think of it much like a normal wave. It's just very long. So you have a, tr you may have, a, and this is a wave that's generated discreetly. It's not continuous. So the wave starts coming at some point, and you may see a trough before you see a crest. So you may see water going out for a few minutes before it comes in, but it may be the other way around. And the same event may cause waves of both types, depending on which direction the wave is coming from. Any other questions? All right. So for the last 10 minutes or so, I'll start introducing tides. And we're going to discuss these in the context of us being a special kind of wave. Okay? There are waves with the wavelength that's on the length scale of the circumference of our planet. So there, you know, we talked about wind waves, which may have wavelengths of the order of the length of this lecture hall. We've talked about now tsunamis that may have wavelengths of hundreds of kilometers. Now we're talking about tides that may have wavelengths of tens of thousands of kilometers. In fact, that's typical of them. And we experience tides as a rhythmic, a rhythmic rise and fall of sea level once or twice per day, usually twice per day. And you're going to learn in your lab next week that this actually has a great effect not just on, of course, human lives, like whether or not you can take your fishing boat out, but also on the structure of the ecology of organisms living near the seashore. Okay, so one key thing I want you to remember about tides, if you remember nothing else, and hopefully you will remember many other things too, is that tides are astronomical in their origin. They're caused by interactions between the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. And so it's worth taking a minute to just learn a little bit about the basic geometry of the system. And this, by the way, this figure is the best one I could find. It's a little bit more complicated than we actually need, and I actually blanked out lots of stuff that was on here that's even weirder than what's left. But at its basic elements, we have the sun. We have the Earth, which orbits the sun once per year, and we already learned about that in the context of learning about seasons, because the Earth's tilt axis, sorry, the Earth's spin axis is tilted with respect to the plane in which it orbits the sun. And then finally, we have the moon orbiting around the Earth, once every 27 days or so, okay, a little bit less than once, sorry, a little bit more often than once per month. Okay. And hopefully it makes sense that as the Earth goes around the sun, at various times the moon will be around a different part of the Earth, 
And the or relative orientations of the moon and the sun relative to the Earth will change also. Okay, so why do we have this happening? The basic idea is that the Earth is in orbit around the sun and the moon is in orbit around the Earth. Orbit meaning a closed path, more or less circular. In some cases, it's elliptical. Actually, it's always elliptical. In some cases, it looks circular. And it's basically a result of a balance between gravity, which tends to draw massive things together, and centrifugal forces, which tend to make things require a force to keep them going in a curved path. So a classic thought experiment you can think of is, we've already talked about cannons in this class probably enough, but we're going to do it some more anyway. Imagine we have a cannon mounted in this case on the North Pole. And of course, if you shoot a normal cannonball, it'll go some distance and then fall to Earth. But you can imagine if you had a really strong cannon, okay, before it falls, it might travel some significant fraction of the Earth's circumference. Okay, in which case, if you're traveling through the air, or even above the air, and you're traveling tens of thousands of kilometers, you notice that the Earth is curving away from you as you're trying to go in a straight line. Okay, so that cannonball, as it's falling, actually has to fall extra because the Earth's surface is curving away from it as it's trying to fall back towards the Earth. Okay, and the stronger the velocity of that cannonball, the more it senses that curvature of the Earth. And in fact, if you make the cannonball go fast enough, it never actually makes it all the way down to the ground. It's trying to fall to the ground, but the Earth is curving as fast as that cannonball is falling. Okay, and so the cannonball just ends up falling all the way around in a circle and comes back again. Okay? Now, if you have two bodies that are actually both massive, okay, instead of a little cannonball around a big planet Earth, like, for instance, we might see in the Kuiper Belt objects, I guess we're not supposed to call them a planet anymore, Pluto and its moon, Charon. These actually, as far as we can tell, have fairly similar sizes and masses. Not exactly the same, but they're actually in a situation where, because their masses are fairly close together, they're actually falling towards each other and missing all the time. Okay, so they're always falling towards each other, but by the time it gets to where the other one was, it's moved out of the way. Okay? And instead, they end up in a more or less circular orbit around their common center of mass. And this is basically how orbits work. Bodies try to fall together, okay, but if they have sideways velocities, they're unable to actually meet. And instead, they end up going around in a circle. They fall in a circle. This is true for the Earth around the Sun. And this is true for the Moon around the Earth. OK. So if we look in a little bit more detail, and by the way, this picture is not to scale. The Moon is not this close to us, thankfully. The picture at the very top is actually to scale, the Earth being on the top left, and the little tiny little Moon being over here on the top right. So that's actually how far the Moon is away from us to scale. But just to make things clear, the Earth is orbiting the Sun, which is 150 miles, sorry, 150 million kilometers off this way. And the Moon is orbiting the Earth, and it's orbiting the Earth almost in the same plane as the Earth goes around the Sun, but inclined by a few degrees, five degrees or so. And of course, we already know that the Earth's spin axis is tilted by 23 degrees or so from that plane as well. Okay? The Moon is a little less than 400,000 kilometers away from the Earth. It's much closer than the Sun. And the common center of mass, okay, we're both orbiting around our common center of mass, the Earth and the Moon, is about four or 5,000 kilometers from the center of the Earth. So it turns out the center of mass in the Earth-Moon system is not at the center of the Earth. It's actually about three quarters of the way from the center of the Earth towards whichever direction the Moon happens to be. Okay, so we're actually wobbling a little bit as the Moon orbits around us. Now, one of the most obvious things you may notice if you look up at the moon, and luckily in Los Angeles, we have clear skies often enough that you actually can see the moon. I think I went a year in college in Chicago without seeing the moon. Its phase changes, okay? Depending on what time of the month, what time of the lunar month, you look up and see the moon, it may be looking different. Sometimes of the month, it is almost black in the sky, okay? You may not be able to see it at all. And sometimes of the month, it's completely lit up. You have a full moon. And in fact, that cycle takes 
a little bit longer than one orbit of the moon, about 28 days or so, okay, a little bit less than a calendar month. And what happens is that starting from a new moon, gradually more and more of the moon becomes visible until after about a week, you can see half the moon. To make sure you get as confused as possible by this, okay, when you can see half the moon, that's the quarter. It gets bigger and bigger until you can see the full surface of the moon. That's the full moon. Then about a week later, it's shrunk again, so you only can see half of it. That's the third quarter. And then about a week after that, it's waned. It's gotten smaller and becomes a new moon again. Okay, so what causes this? It turns out to be important for understanding how tides work to understand why the phases of the moon work the way they do. So let's again take a very simplified cartoon picture. Here's the sun. Here's the Earth orbiting around the sun. And here's the moon orbiting around the Earth. Okay, again, very much not to scale here. Distances are much larger than are depicted here. And let's imagine that at the beginning of May of 2005, we have a new moon. Well, essentially what that means is, from the perspective of the Earth, the moon is in the same direction as the sun, or very nearly so. So that when we look up at the moon, we're seeing the part of the moon that's facing away from the sun, towards us. And that's not going to be receiving much sunlight, so it's going to appear dark to us. If we wait a week, the moon will have gone almost a quarter, about a quarter away around its orbit. And so at that point, when we look up from the Earth towards the moon, we're seeing half of the moon that's facing towards the sun, and half that's facing away from the sun is in and is in shadow. And so we see a moon that looks like it's half lit up. Okay, that's the quarter. A week later, now the moon is on the opposite side of the planet from the sun. So when we look up at the moon, we're seeing only the sunlit part that's reflecting sunlight back towards us. And then a week later, we see a quarter again, and then a week after that, another new moon. Okay, so the phase of the moon, the appearance of the moon in the sky, depends on the relative orientation of the moon relative to the Earth moon line. Sorry, the Earth sun line. All right. During what time of day will you be able to see a new moon straight up in the sky, or as high in the sky as it's going to get? If the moon's over here and full, what time is it on Earth when you're right under that moon? If I'm on this part of the Earth, I'm on the opposite side from the sun, right? So what time of day is it when you're on the opposite side of the Earth from the sun? Midnight, right? So the full moon's going to be up high in the sky at midnight, okay? Depending on daylight savings time, it may be 1 a.m., but around midnight. How about a new moon? What time of day is the new moon going to be high in the sky? What time of day is it when you're here? It's about noon, okay? So not only during a new moon is the side of the moon facing us dark, but the sun's in the sky, which makes it really hard to see a new moon. All right. What phase of the moon is it going to be when there's a solar eclipse? If the moon is actually casting a shadow on the Earth, what phase is the moon in? It's going to be a new moon. All right. So review session on Tuesday, and we'll come back on Friday for the midterm, and then on Monday, continue talking about tides.